Okay, everybody, let's get started. I'm so glad to see you're all here for the new semester. I see a few familiar faces and welcome all of you to Improv One. Since this is the first day, I have some things to do to check people in, make sure my records are right, all that kind of stuff. And so I'd like you to do an exercise in pairs while I get to all of that. This is a great exercise for getting those improv muscles working, and it should be a lot of fun. I want you to pair up with somebody who is a stranger to you. And then I want you to imagine with your partner that you know each other very well. So well, in fact, that you already know the secrets of the other one and they know all yours. What I found is that this allows you to just jump right in and not go through anything where you pretend to get to know each other. This works especially well when the improv actors really don't know each other. No reality to draw on whatsoever. Remember, there is no right or wrong things to say. Just go get into the scene and go with the flow. Just go where you and your partner lead you. Okay, I'm re really, really eager to just plunge in. But are there any questions? Yes, Lydia. Yeah, do you mean like we pretend we know these people, that they're like friends? Yes, exactly. You really know them. Okay, cool. But do we always have to agree with what they say? No. See, you would just talk to them the way you would talk to any friend. Do you always agree with your friends? No. So this is just the same. Marcy, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, I, I, I guess my question is, what if we just, like, don't have anything to, like, say to them? Uh, I guess I'm kind of nervous, I guess. If you can't think of anything to say, then you can't think of anything to say. But why not just trust yourself? If you're talking to a friend, you probably will have something to say, right? I guess. Nathan, yes, another question. Yeah, I'm trying to get this. Do we make stuff up about ourselves or do we tell the truth? I can't figure out which you want. That's because it doesn't matter what you choose. Just go with it and your partner. <clears throat> but, like, do we like each other? Or... Well, you know. you're friends. Oh. Well, you're friends, so you probably do like each other. But maybe there are issues. Just let it evolve. Come on, everybody. Have a little faith. Give it a chance and just go with it. So I want everyone to pair up with a stranger, if you would. Okay, let's do that now. Okay, everybody got a partner? Rebecca, do you have a partner? Okay, good. Remember, you have just reconnected with a very close friend. So... Uh... What have you been up to, old pal? Well, you know, uh, same, same. Uh, you? Oh, as you know, uh, I got back from the African safari. Boy, it was great to be home. Oh, oh yeah. How, how was that, the, the big safari? <laughs> it was awesome. We bagged a rhino and two female lions. What? What do you mean, bagged? Oh, you know, shot, killed, bagged. Wait, what? I, I thought this was a regular photo safari. You, you killed those animals? Isn't that illegal? Well, yeah, but if you find the right guy, pay the right price, yeah, just go ahead. He helps you out afterwards. Later, I'll show you the great pictures we got. We got to stand on the rhino just like Don Jr. Dude, it was so sick. Well, I read somewhere that big game hunters, they were compensating for something weaker, smaller, less masculine. Oh, yeah? Well, you know I don't have a problem in that department, pal. So... So what is it you've been doing since I last saw you? Uh, I, I've been working out more. Uh, I spent the fall helping get the vote out for November. 
And I've started volunteering at an animal shelter. God, I, I love those animals. They're so, they're so lost, but so lovable. Well, aren't we the humanitarian? Have you been dating? Or have you just been hanging with the lost dogs? Or lost dance? <laughs> when I said dating, I meant dating girls. No, I've been dating girls, although I'm not seeing anyone right now. I, I just broke up with someone. You know, Janet. You met her. Remember? Uh, bummer. Dude, you gotta keep them satisfied. You know I've been telling you that for years. Oh, but who could forget that, that little problem that you had last year? Hey, man, I don't know what you're talking about, but I have been meaning to tell you, um, how do I say this? Uh, while you were gone, I started hanging out with your girlfriend. She was so nice to me after I broke up with Janet. And, you know, one thing kind of led to another. And uh, so while you were out bagging animals, <laughs> you weren't the only one. I'm surprised she didn't tell you. Well, that just isn't true. You know how I know it isn't true? It's because apparently you couldn't deliver with what's her name? Janet? So you certainly couldn't with my girl, you liberals. You're all the same. All talk, no delivery. What the hell do you mean by that? You're putting on this humanity act when you know you're all just out for yourselves, you posers. Oh, yeah? Well, what about you? <laughs> I've known you for a long time, but I cannot stand your politics. And now, now you're out murdering Innocent animals? For for fun? How, how did we ever get to be friends? We didn't! <laughs> you liberal. I wish we hadn't been paired for this stupid class exercise. Because I think you're an idiot, liberals. You can't see the, the threats right in front of your face. All you want to do is give everyone a handout, and you forget the people who made this country great. Oh, oh yeah, like uh, Robert E. Lee, um, Andrew Jackson, more murdering? You fascist. I, I wouldn't be your friend if you were the last Nazi on Earth. You know, why, why don't you go off to your Klan rally and get out of this class? Not before I clean your clock, asshole. How could this happen? I've been using this exercise for 10 years. Maybe I should just quit teaching. Nonsense. They're young. Honey, they're young men. The rest of the students loved the exercise. Come on now, one backfire doesn't damn the whole exercise. <laughs> I talked to the two of them after I begged the police not to arrest them, and they said they just got so furious that it wasn't an exercise anymore. They said they really got carried away. In fact, Trevor was still unclear on, not, on whether or not Ralph was making up the part about his girlfriend. Ah. Uh. That's right. They just got carried away. Paul, you always do this. Any problem in the classroom is all your fault. How can that be? Everyone is there making choices, listening to you or not, and, and doing what they do. It can't be all you all the time, darling. I think this is part of the reason you're such a good teacher is you take everything on, but sometimes it just isn't healthy. I know. But the real reason I feel so awful is that this is an improv class, Midge, an improv class. And the first rule about improv that I am responsible for getting into their heads is that they never ever insult or denigrate or express hostility toward their improv partner. 
Never, ever. <sighs> the successful improv rests on that rule. Those guys obviously didn't get the message. And if they didn't get the message, I failed them. Look, I'm still not buying it. What you've always said is the other first rule is you give yourself over to the character you co-create with your improv partner. Well, see? Underneath it all, that trouble what happened is really great. They were really getting into the roles. You're always telling everyone to go with it. Well, honey, they went with it. Excuse me. Um, excuse me. Yes? I want to get over there. I'm sorry, but I can't let you. Why not? You tell me. I don't know why you won't let me. It's my job. But I want to go there. I have to go there. You're afraid. I am not. It's apparent you're afraid. If you weren't, you would just cross the line and come over here. But the line is there for a reason, isn't it? I, I don't just go crossing lines that are there for a reason. That's your problem. I don't have a problem crossing the line. I'm just, it's not my style to go crossing lines that are there for a reason. Fear, and that's just an excuse. You're afraid. Look. I want to go there, and I will. I don't think you will. Well, you're wrong. I've been wanting to go there. But you haven't. No, not yet. Why not? I don't know. That's not an answer. You have the answer. You also have the question. I have the question? We all have questions. But you said, I have the question. What's the question mean? It means you have to have the question to be able to find the answer. I just want to go over there. That's not a question. It's not the answer either. How, how do you know and who the hell are you? I've heard you. I've watched you. I am you. Oh, give me a break. We've never met. But we have. When? Long time ago. What were we doing? This. Exactly this. Meaning? I was on this side of the line, you were on that side of the line, and you wanted to get over here. This is the first time I've ever been here. No, you come here all the time. That's why you can't cross the line. Because I've been here and I can't remember being here? What does that have to do with me not being able to cross this line? You never learn. How can I learn if I can't remember being here? What am I supposed to be learning anyway? Only you can decide that. Okay, fine. I want to learn how to cross that line. Maybe you can't. You just said, I have to decide what I want to learn, and I want to learn how to cross that line. Okay. Pick up the chair. What? Pick up that chair. Okay, I picked up the chair. Am I supposed to be learning to pick up a chair? I already know how. How did you pick it up? I don't know. I just picked it up. No learning happening here. Okay, I'm supposed to be learning something. You mean, what was I thinking when I picked up the chair? No. How did you pick it up? 
how do we do anything? You told me to pick up the chair and I picked it up. Keep going. You told me to pick up the chair. Okay. I listened to you speak to me and you said words that I interpreted. Okay, and? I turned to the chair. Why did you turn to the chair? You told me to. Did I? Um, no, but I had to turn to the chair to pick it up. You told me to pick it up. Learning, good. Okay, I think I'm on to you. I listened to you speak to me. I made a decision on what I was going to do and I followed the decision with an action, which was to raise the chair off the ground. So there. You said we never met, but you were willing to pick up a chair because I asked you to. And because I made the decision to do it. You didn't force me. We're getting smarter. So why do you want to cross over the line? It's all I've been thinking about. It's what I've been wanting to do because, because I think my dreams are over there, not here. Dreams, good. You just want them and you don't have a reason why, right? Like when you picked up the chair. Right, I don't have a reason, I just, have those dreams. And I still don't know why you had me do that. Because you just did it. You didn't analyze how much the chair would weigh or where you would put your hands. None of that. You just did it. No judgment. No, I can't. No, why not? You just did it. I guess. You didn't guess. And that's just it. You didn't create all kinds of scenarios about the chair, like where it was from or what style it was or, or whether you could lift it or not. You just lifted it. Right. I didn't think, I just did. And now you wanna cross over this line and you aren't analyzing why, you just want to. And that my friend, that's the definition of a dream. But it, it feels like my dreams are over there, not here. Where do you feel it? In my heart, my stomach, my chest. Damn it. What is this line and why can't I cross it? Because you put it here. I did not. You did. No, you put it right here yourself. I put this line here? <laughs> you did. That makes no sense at all. Sure it does. How? It started when you were a baby. Every child has a natural curiosity and you would go all around your room looking at everything. One day you had noticed the electric socket in the wall and it looked so interesting. You wanted to touch it with your little pinky, but your parents yelled, no! They were just trying to protect me from getting hurt. But, but don't you see, you had an innate desire to touch that socket. You've lost me. Your natural impulse was denied with a, no, don't do that. And, and that's when the line started. I don't understand. Okay. First time you saw the ocean, you had the desire, as all kids do, to run wildly into those waves, right? It was your innate desire. But again, your parents, they yelled, no. I do remember that. I remember my father picked me up right before I was going to jump in. But again, he was just protecting me. I didn't know how to swim. But you didn't get to run into the ocean that day. Your natural impulse, again, was denied with a no, don't do that. You were just a kid. What did you learn? What were you constantly learning? 
don't do the things I want to do. They're too dangerous. Or <laughs> your dreams aren't good enough. <laughs> Go against the family culture or the community culture, etc., etc., etc. No, don't do that. And that's how and when you made this line thicker and longer. This line. Because each time I've had a dream, I've been told I couldn't have it. I'm blocked from having it. Right. Each time your dreams get squashed, this line gets thicker and longer. Why? To protect yourself. From what? From your true desires, those, those dreams of yours. To keep me out? I'm going to get hurt if I cross this line to go after my dreams? To keep you in, safe. Safe? But I have to cross that line if my dreams are over there. Then cross your line. I don't know what's over there. Why is that stopping you? What is stopping you? Me. I'm stopping me. I put the line there. I did. You did. And my dreams are on the other side. They are. I'm afraid I'll never find them. You'll find them. You created them. But everybody says my dreams are too big and I'll never achieve them. Did any of them achieve their dreams? No. No. They didn't. They stopped dreaming. They quit. Why would I listen to them? So, so here I am on the edge of my abilities, that's what this line is. What I think I can or can't do. I can't believe I've been standing here when my dreams are so damn close. It's all over there. Everything I've ever wanted is over there. There is absolutely nothing here for me anymore. Okay, that's it. I'm coming over. What's wrong with me? There's nothing wrong with you. I'm weak. I'm pathetic. You're human. You're learning. You're beginning. I'm stuck. Well, that's an illusion. Just like this line. I need a push. Then push yourself. No. No. I can't do that. I, I need someone else to push me. No one will push you towards your dreams like you can. What if I fail? What if you fail? I'm afraid I'll never try and cross this line again if I go after my dreams and fail. Then fail and find out. Wait, you said that you've watched me and that you know me and that you are me. Wait a minute, you're that part of myself who stopped me from getting everything I ever wanted. Damn you. I've been waiting for you. You don't look like me. You'd be surprised what people look like on the inside. You put me here to protect you. I don't need your protection anymore. There's more to me than this, this small little life I've been living. There's always more. Go! But how do you know it'll be worth it? I don't. But I can't stay here anymore.
I have the question and I have the answer. What's the question? What are we willing to do to cross over our fears and achieve our dreams? And the answer? Everything. I wouldn't sit there if I was you. What? You need to get up off my bench. Are you kidding me? You think this is your bench? Well, it's mine today. No, it's not. I can sit wherever I want. It's a park. We're outside. You don't own this bench. Look. I don't want any hassle, but I told you, you wouldn't want to sit there. So just get off the bench. I like sitting on this bench. In fact, if you weren't sitting right there, I would be. I come here every day and sit in that seat and watch the birds in that tree right there. Well, I'm not getting up. And you can't sit here today, so up you go. I can sit here, and I will sit here. In fact, since I sit here every day, I think this is actually my bench. And you should get off, off my bench and my seat. No, you should get up off this bench and go sit by the tree if you want to watch the birds so badly, and we'll both be happy. There's Go no on. comfortable place to sit. And besides, I'd be too close. Oh, right. And what, why don't you like being too close? Do I have to spell it out for you? They're birds, aren't they? Would you want to sit right under them? I said go sit closer, not under them. You need to get up. Did it ever occur to you that some people sitting on a bench may want to be alone? Are used to being alone? You, you go. You want me to leave you alone? Well, that's not going to happen. I am sitting here eating my lunch until I'm done, and I don't plan on going anywhere until I'm done. See that? That is the problem with the world today. <laughs> What's the problem? People like you are the problem. Well, I didn't start this. You did. I did? All I did was sit on my bench. <sighs> you didn't ask me if you could sit down. I told you you shouldn't sit there. I didn't ask you? Since when does someone have to ask someone if they could sit on a public outdoor park bench? I asked you to get off the bench. I thought that would be enough. I have a right to sit where I am. And I have a right to ask you to get up. I'll tell you what the problem really is. What would that be? Me, of course? Yeah. You're being selfish. Selfish? I'm trying to be helpful. Helpful? Never mind. Okay, so when will your lunch be over? Looks like you only have a couple bites. Not yet. Well, hurry up. I want to sit in my seat. Well, I would have been done with my lunch and my day already if you hadn't sat down. 
Are you sure you don't want to get up off the bench? Why would I get up off the bench? I told you, I come here every day. Oh, so you have all the time in the world to come sit in this bench every day. Good for you. I come here every day now that I'm alone. I've never seen you here before. No, you haven't. I live on the other side of town and it's my first time here and my last, I hope. And I'm sorry you're alone. No, you aren't. You sit on my bench in my seat, but you don't even like this park and you won't get up and leave me alone. What is wrong with you? Nothing is wrong with me. I'm just used to working indoors mostly. Now, let me ask you this. Why didn't you just ask me if you could sit down? Oh, I don't know. Because I don't have to? I told you that. Would my answer have made any difference if it was in your best interest? I doubt what you think is in my best interest actually is. So, no, it wouldn't have made a difference. Not at all. Okay, well, I'm going to ask you one more time. Please, will you please get off this bench? I'm asking you nicely, right? Why do you want me off this bench? Why do you keep telling me what to do? I am not telling you what to do. I'm telling you what you might want to do. And why would I want to do that? What do you think? I have been trying to figure that out this whole time. I have no idea. What? What is your big issue that I sat down and didn't ask you? Do I, do I smell or something? What? No, but do you smell anything? A faint smell? I hadn't noticed. Not really. But you noticed I was eating my lunch. Yeah, so? I am on my lunch break. Oh, well, I didn't know that. But what does that have to do with anything? Well, I do these kind of jobs. When I do these kind of jobs, I always take a lunch break, sitting on the dry part of the bench, when I'm done painting that part of the bench. <sighs> ah! What? Oh my God. Why did you tell me? You didn't ask. I am so glad to be here. I had feared that my bench may be occupied. What a beautiful morning. Oh, here they come, my little birds. They know just when to expect me. Let me get my breadcrumbs. Oh, this is for the spryest, and this is for the gluttons, and this is for the little ones that are the most persistent. <laughs> oh, that one is always first. I know him by his big head. And that one, he's such a little fellow, but so much of a little glutton. And that one, he takes his food and flies up to that branch all alone. He is a philosopher. <laughs> but where do they all come from, I wonder? 
Oh, the news has spread. Don't quarrel, little ones. I have plenty for all. I will bring more tomorrow. I want a bench to myself. Those priests there, they're sitting on my bench. They should be saying mass. They're idling their time away, just as if they were glued to the seat, no hope of their leaving. And there's the old lady here, oh well. Oh, look out! Are you speaking to me, Signora? Yes, to you. What do you wish? Well, you have scared away the birds who were feeding on my crumbs. What do I care about the birds? But I do. This is a public park. Then why do you complain that the priests have taken your bench? Signor, we have not met, and I cannot imagine why you take the liberty of addressing me. What an ill-natured old man. Why must people get so fussy and cross when they reach a certain age? Oh, I'm glad he lost that bench too. Serves him right for scaring away the birds. Oh, he's furious. Yes, yes, find a seat if you can, poor man. Oh, he's wiping the perspiration from his face. Oh, here he comes. A carriage would not rise more dust than his feet. The authorities should place more benches here for the sunny morning as well. I suppose I'll design myself to sit on the bench with the old lady. <laughs> oh, what, you here again? I repeat, we have not met. I was responding to your salute. Good morning should be answered by good morning, and that is all you should have said. Well, you should have asked permission to sit on this bench, which is mine. The benches here are public property. <laughs> Why, you said the one the priests have was yours. Very well, very well. I have nothing more to say. <clears throat> See now, old lady, she ought to be at home knitting, or whatever old ladies do. Oh, don't grumble anymore. I'm not going to leave just to please you. If the ground were sprinkled a little more, it would sure help matters. Oh, do you use your handkerchief as a shoe brush? Why not? Do you use your shoe brush as a handkerchief? What right have you to criticize my actions? A neighbor's right. I do not care to listen to more. Oh, you are very polite. Pardon me, Signora, but never interfere with what does not concern you. I generally say what I think. And more to the same effect. Oh. oh my, I thought you were taking out a telescope. Was that you? Your sight must be keen. Keener than yours is. Oh, yes, evidently. Ask the hares and partridges. Ah, do you hunt? I did, and even now. Oh, yes, of course. Yes, Signora. Every Sunday I take my gun and dog, and, you understand, and go to one of my estates near Aravaca and kill time. Yes, kill time. That is all you kill. Do you think so? I could show you a wild boar head in my study. Yes, and I can show you a tiger skin in my boudoir. What does that prove? Very well, Signora. <clears throat> Please, allow me to read enough conversation. Well, you subside then. But first I shall take a pinch of snuff. Will you have some? Mm, if it is good. It is of the finest. You will like it. Hmm. It clears my head. <clears throat> and mine too. Do you sneeze? Yes, Signora, three times. And so do I. What a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> There. I feel better. Ah, oh, so do I. The snuff has made peace between us. You'll excuse me if I read aloud. Oh, read as loud as you please. You will not disturb me. All love is sad, but sad is it is the best thing we know. That is from Capo Amor. Ah. Oh. The daughters of the women I once loved kiss me now as they would a graven image. Those lines, I take it, are in a humorous vein. Yes, I take them so, too. There are some beautiful poems in this book. Here. <clears throat> Twenty years pass. He returns. Oh, you cannot imagine how it affects me to see you reading with all those glasses. Well, can you read without any? Certainly. At your age, you're jesting. Pass me the book, then. Ah, Twenty years pass. He returns. And each beholding the other exclaims, Can it be 
that this is he. Heavens, it is she. Indeed, I envy you your wonderful eyesight. I know every word by heart. I'm very fond of good verses, very fond. I even composed some in my youth. Good ones? Of all kinds. I was a great friend of Esfranceda, Zuria, Becquier, and others. I first met Zuria in America. Why, have you been in America? Well, several times. The first time I was only six when I went. Oh, you must have gone with Columbus in one of his caravels. <laughs> not quite as bad as that. I am old, I admit, but I did not know Ferdinand and Isabella. <laughs> I was also a great friend of Campo Amor. I met him in Valencia. I am a native of that city. You are? I was brought up there, and there I spent my early youth. Have you ever visited that city? Oh, yes, senor. Not far from Valencia, there was a villa that, if still there, should retain memories of me. I spent several seasons there. It was many, many years ago. It was near the sea, hidden away among lemon and orange trees. They called it, let me see, what did they call it? Um, Maricela. Maricela? Maricela. Is that name familiar to you? Yes, very familiar. If my memory serves me right, for we forget as we grow old, there lived in that villa the most beautiful woman I have ever seen, and I assure you I have seen many. Let me see, what was her name? Laura. Laura, Laura Lorente. Laura Lorente? Yes. Oh, um, nothing. I... You reminded me of my best friend. How strange. Uh, it is strange. She was called the Silver Maiden. Precisely, the Silver Maiden. By that name, she was known in that locality. I seem to see her as if she was before me now at that window with the red roses. You remember that window? Yes, I remember. It was the window of her room. She spent many hours there. I mean, I mean in my day. Ah, uh, and in mine, too. She was ideal. Fair as the lily. She had black hair and black eyes with an uncommonly ex a sweet expression. She seemed to cast a radiance wherever she was. Her figure was beautiful, perfect. What forms of sovereign beauty God models in her life. She was a dream. If you but knew that that dream was now by your side, you would realize what dreams come to. She was very unfortunate and had a very sad love affair. Very sad. Did you hear of it? Yes. Oh, the ways of providence are strange. This is Gonzalo. The gallant lover in the same affair. Ah, oh, the duel. Precisely, the duel. The gallant lover was my cousin, oh. of whom I was very fond of. Oh, yes, a cousin. <laughs> uh, my friend told me in one of her letters the story of that love affair. It was truly romantic. He, uh, your cousin, passed by on horseback every morning down the rose path under her window and tossed up to her balcony a beautiful bouquet of flowers which she caught. And later in the afternoon, the gallant horseman would return by the same path and catch the bouquet of flowers she would toss him. Am I right? Yes. They wanted to marry her to a merchant who she would not have. Then one night, when my cousin waited under her window to hear her sing, this other person presented himself unexpectedly. And insulted your cousin. And there was a quarrel. And later a duel. Yes, at sunrise on the beach, and the merchant was badly wounded. And uh, my cousin <clears throat> had to conceal himself for a few days, and later to fly. Oh, you seem to know the story well. And so do you. Oh, I have explained that a friend repeated it to me. As my cousin did to me. This is Laura. Oh, why tell him? He does not suspect. He's entirely innocent. And was it you, by any chance, who advised your cousin to forget Laura? Why, my cousin never forgot her. How do you count then for his conduct? Well, I will tell you. The young man took refuge in my house, fearful of the consequences of a duel with a person highly regarded in that locality. From my home, he went to Seville, then came to Madrid. He wrote Laura many letters, some of them in verse. But undoubtedly, they were intercepted by her parents, for he, she never answered at all. Gonzalo, then in despair, believing his love lost to him forever, joined the army, went to Africa, and there 
in a trench, met a glorious death, grasping the flag of Spain and whispering the name of his beloved Laura. Oh, what an outrageous lie. Could not have killed myself more gloriously. You must have been prostrated by the calamity. Yes, indeed, Signora, as if he were my brother. I presume, though, on the contrary, that Laura in a short time was chasing butterflies in her garden, indifferent to regret. No, Signor, no. It is a woman's way. It... Oh, even if it were a woman's way, the silver maiden was not of that disposition. My friend awaited news for days, months, a year, and no letter came. One afternoon, just at sunset, as the first stars were appearing, she was seen to leave the house and with quickening steps wind her way towards the beach, the beach where her beloved had risked his life. She wrote his name on the sand, then sat down on a rock, her gaze fixed upon the horizon. The waves murmured their eternal trinity and slowly crept up to the rock where the maiden sat. The tide rose with a boom and swept her out to sea. Good heavens! The fishermen of that shore, who often tell the story, a fern, it was a long time before the waves washed away that name on the sand. You will not get ahead of me in decorating my own funeral. She lies worse than I do. Poor Laura. Poor Gonzalo. I will not tell him that I married two years later. In three months, I ran off to Paris with a ballerina. Oh, fate is curious. Here are you and I complete strangers met by chance discussing the romance of old friends from long ago we have been conversing as if we are old friends uh, yes it is curious considering the ill-natured prelude to our conversation oh you scared away the birds i was unreasonable perhaps yes that was evident are you coming tomorrow again well, certainly if it is a sunny morning and not only will I not scare away the birds, but I will bring a few crumbs. Oh, thank you very much. Birds are grateful and repay attention. No, no. I'll not reveal myself. I am grotesque now. Better that she recall the gallant horseman who passed daily beneath her window tossing the flowers. No, I am too sadly changed. It is better that he should remember me as the black-eyed girl tossing flowers as he passed among the roses in the garden. My dear lady, this has been a great honor and a great pleasure. It has also been a pleasure to me. Goodbye until tomorrow. Until tomorrow. If it is sunny. A sunny morning. Will you go to your bench? No, I will come to this, if you do not object. This bench is at your disposal. And I will surely bring the crumbs. Tomorrow, then? Tomorrow. Oh, yes, it is he. It is she, and no mistake. Can it be that this is he? Heavens, is it she? Scene one, the curtain rises upon an office scene. Seemingly, there is nothing unusual about this office. It has tables, chairs, a filing cabinet, and a hat rack. A portion of the office is railed off at the right. Within this enclosed space is a commodious desk and swivel chair, and the filing cabinet stands against the wall. This railed off portion of the office belongs exclusively to the judge. Here he is wont to spend many hours, sometimes to read or write, and again, perhaps, he will just sit and ponder upon the vagaries of mankind. When we first see the judge, he is reading a letter, and evidently he is not pleased, for he is tapping with impatient fingers upon his desk. At the left of the room is a heavily curtained door, which leads to an inner room. At center rear is another door, which evidently leads to the street as it is through this door that the poor man, the vain woman, and the rich citizen will presently enter, each upon his special quest. The hat rack stands near the street door, and we glimpse a soft black hat and a long black overhat, 
overcoat hanging upon it. To the left is a flat top desk littered with papers and letters. This desk has two large drawers wherein a number of miscellaneous articles might be kept. It is at this desk that we catch our first glimpse of him. He is busily writing in a huge ledger and he seems to be enjoying his work for he chuckles the while. Imp is a little rogue, he looks it and acts it, and we feel that he has a Mephistophelian spirit. He is ever chuckling impishly. <laughs> we feel that he is slyly gleeful over the weaknesses of mankind and the difficulties that beset them. Your Honor, I have all the miseries listed to date and a fine lot there is to choose from. Everything from bunions to old wives for exchange. And here's another one. A woman suspects her husband of a misalliance. Wants to catch him, but is so crippled with rheumatism that it, she can't get about to check on him. He wants us to exchange her rheumatism for something that won't interfere with either her walking or her eyesight. We have a defective heart or a lazy liver that we could give her. She would not be satisfied. People never are. They always want to change their miseries, but never their vices. Each thinks his own cross heavier than others have to bear, but very willing to make light of his own weaknesses and shortcomings. He thinks they are not half so bad as his neighbors. I've tried for years to aid distressed humanity, but I can't satisfy them. I'm going tired of it all, imp. People need a lesson, and <laughs> they're going to get it too. <laughs> I'm going to. Here comes another misery. Imp opens the door to admit the poor man who is very shabbily dressed. Is that him? Do I dare speak to him? Yes. Be careful what you say. Your Honor, I, I have a little favor to ask of you. Well? Well, you see, Your Honor, I've been poor all my life. I've never had much fun. I don't, I don't ask for a lot of money, but I would like enough to have some swell clothes and and, and to have, to eat, drink, and be merry with the boys, you know. I just want to have a good time. Do you think you could fix it for me, Judge? So, you just want to have a good time. You want me to take away your poverty. Mm -hmm. I suppose you have no moral weaknesses you want to change, no defects in your character that you want to better? Um... Well, why judge? I, I'm not a bad man. I mean, I mean, I have my faults, but I've never committed any crimes. I guess I stack up pretty fair as far as men go. I just, I'm awful tired of being poor and never having any fun. Couldn't you help me out on that point, judge? Bring me the ledger. Him gives him the ledger in which he has been writing. You understand, do you, my good man, that if I take away your poverty and give you enough money to have your good time, you'll have to accept another misery. Yes, Your Honor. That's all right. I'm willing. Oh, very well. Let's see here. Here is paralysis. Well, I, I couldn't have a very good time if, if I was paralyzed. Uh, I suppose not. How about a glass eye? Please, Your Honor, if I'm going to have a good time, I need two good eyes. I don't want to miss a thing. A man has left his wife here for exchange. Perhaps you would like her. Oh, Judge. Oh, no, please. No, I don't want anyone's cast off old wife. I'll choose something and be quick about it. Well, here's lumbago and gout and fatness excuse and old me, age. And uh, excuse me, Judge, but maybe the gentleman 
would like the indigestion that Mr. Potter left when he took old Mrs. Pratt's fallen arches. Indigestion? Sure, that would be fine. I don't mind a little thing like indigestion if I can get rid of my poverty. Very well. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I swear to accept indigestion for better or for worse as my portion of the world's miseries. So help me God. I swear to accept indigestion for better or for worse as my portion of this world's miseries. So help me God. Show this man to the, to the changing room. Poor man follows Imp, who conducts him to the heavily curtained door. The poor man throws out his chest and swaggers a bit as a man might who had suddenly come into a fortune. Imp swaggers along with him. Won't you have a grand time, though? I'll get you a menu card so you can be picking out your dinner. Good idea, and I'll pick out a regular banquet. And there you are. He's perfectly satisfied with his morals, has no defects in his character, just wants to have a, a good time. Street door opens slowly, and the vain woman stands upon the threshold. She does not enter at once, but stands posing. Presumably, she desires to attract attention, and she is worthy of it. She has a superb figure, and her rich gowning enhances it. Her fair face reveals a shallow prettiness, but the wrinkles of age are beginning to leave telltale lines upon its smoothness. As Imp hurries forward to usher her in, she sweeps grandly past him to the center of the room. Judge, I've heard that you are very kind, and I've been told that you help people out of their troubles, so I have a little favor to ask of you. Yes, I supposed so. Go on. Well, you know that I am a famous beauty. In fact, both my face and my form are considered very lovely. Great and celebrated men have worshipped at my feet. I simply cannot live without admiration. It is my very life. But judge, horrid wrinkles are beginning to show in my face. Oh, I would give anything, do anything, to have a smooth, youthful face once more. Please, oh please, won't you take away these wrinkles and give me something in their stead? Are you satisfied with yourself in other ways? Is it, is your character as beautiful as your face? Have you no faults or weaknesses that you want exchanged? Why, I don't know what you mean. I am just as good as any other woman and lots better than some I know. I go to church and I subscribe to the charities and I belong to the best clubs. Oh, please judge. It's these wrinkles that make me so unhappy. Won't you exchange them? You don't want me to be unhappy, do you? Please take them away. Uh, very well, I'll see what I can do for you. I'll fetch a chair for this lady. Imp gives her a chair and she sits facing front. Imp returns to his desk, perches himself upon it and watches the vain woman interestedly. Judge turns over the leaves of the ledger. I have a goiter that I could exchange for your wrinkles. Oh, heavens no. That would ruin my beautiful throat. See, I have a lovely neck. Well, how about hay fever? Oh, judge, how can you suggest such a thing? Watery eyes and a red nose, the worst enemy of beauty there is. I simply couldn't think of it. I want something that won't show. Well, perhaps this will suit you. A woman has grown very tired of her husband and wants to exchange him for some other burden. What? I accept a man that some other woman doesn't want? Certainly not. I prefer one that some other woman does want. <laughs> well, I fear that I cannot please you. I do not have time to... Excuse me. Excuse me, Judge. But maybe the lady would like deafness in exchange for her wrinkles. Deafness wouldn't show, 
so it couldn't spoil her face or her elegant figure. No, it, it won't show. Deafness ought to be a good thing for you. Why, yes, that might do. But well, it wouldn't show. I've a notion to take it. All right, I'll accept it. Hold up your right hand. You swear to accept deafness, for better or for worse, as your portion of the world's misery. So help you God. Oh, yes, Judge, I do. Show the lady to the changing room. No, deafness won't show at all. And you'll have them all crazy about you. Take the second boot to your right. Vain woman stands posing a moment. Then, with a long, drawn sigh of happiness, she exits. It bows low and mockingly after her vanishing form. Do her faults or shortcomings trouble her? Not at all. Perfectly satisfied with herself, but for a few wrinkles on her face. Vain woman. <laughs> bah! Yes, sir. Some women have queer notions. The rap is immediately followed by the rapper's abrupt entrance. We see an important appearing personage. His arrogant bearing and commanding pose lead us to believe that he is accustomed to prompt attention. It is the rich citizen, exceedingly well-groomed. His manner is lordly, but he addresses the judge in a bored tone. When Imp scampers to meet him, the rich citizen hands him his hat and cane and turns at once to the judge. Imp examines the hat and cane critically hangs them on the hat rack, and returns to his desk, where he again perches to watch the rich citizen. I am addressing the judge, am I not? You are. Well, judge, life has become rather boresome, so I thought I'd drop in and ask you to do me a small favor. Yes. What is your grievance? Oh, I wouldn't say grievance exactly. You see, dear judge, it is this way. I am an ex extremely rich and influential citizen, a prominent member of society, and I'm very much sought after. Oh, indeed. Mm. Women run after me day and night. Mm. Ambitious mothers throw their marriageable daughters at my head. Men seek my advice on all matters. I'm compelled to head this and that committee. Well, go on. Well, my prestige has become a burden. I want to get away from it all. I would like to become a plain man with a humble vocation. The, the humbler the better, so that people will cease bothering me. Is your prestige all that troubles you? No. Don't worry about your morals, I, I suppose. Uh, satisfied with your habits and, and character? What have my morals in, have to do with my request? Certainly I'm not one of your saintly men. I live as a man of my station should live, and I think I measure up pretty damn well with the rest of them. I am simply bored, and I would like a change. Well, I suppose you would want to be a plain man with a humble calling. I, I'll see what I have in humble callings. We have several bartender vocations. No. Uh, too many people about all the time and too much noise. Well, here's a janitor's job open to you. No, no, no. no. I don't like that either. Too confining and... Too many people bickering all the time. I want to get out in the open, away from crowds. Well, here's the very thing for you, postman. Oh, no, no. District. No, uh, I, too many old women that want to gossip. I tell you, I want to get away from women. Haven't you something peaceful and quiet, something that would take me out into the early morning when the birds are singing? Well, you're too particular. I have not time to bother with you. I bid you good afternoon. Excuse me, Judge, but maybe the gentleman would like the vocation of milkman. 
that is early morning work, and you remember a milkman left his job here when he took the old senator's worn-out position. Well, how about it? Does a milkman's vocation suit you? It's early morning hours, fresh air, and no people about. Well, the very quietness and simplicity of it is its charm, and it rather appeals to me. Uh, yes, by Jove, I'll take it. Hold up your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to accept for better or for worse the vocation of milkman as your lot in life so help you God? I do. Show this gentleman to the changing room. Yes, sir, you will lead the simple life. Fresh air, fresh milk, no people, just cows, and they can't talk. Third booth, sir. The simple life, peace and quietness. It's no use, Imp. They all cling to their vices. They're very keen to change some little cross or condition that vexes them or think vexes them. It's strange that people always want something different than what they have. Imp opens a drawer in his desk and takes out a bottle, evidently filled with tablets, which he holds up, shaking it and chuckling. He hunts in the drawer again and this time brings forth a huge ear trumpet, which he chucklingly places on his table beside the bottle of tablets. Don't let in any more in, Imp. I can't stand another one today. I'm going to write a letter and, and then I'm going to go home. All right, sir. I'm feeling very tired. And what I really need is a vacation. A sea trip will put me right. By the way, Imp, where is that transatlantic folder I told you to get me? Imp picks up the folder from his desk and takes it to the judge, who studies it attentively. Imp returns to his own desk, where he again looks in a drawer and brings forth a menu card, which he glance glances over, grinning mischievously. <laughs> the former poor man re-enters from the changing room. He is well-dressed, and taking a well-filled wallet from his pocket, he looks at it gloatingly. However, from time to time, a shade of annoyance passes over his face, and he puts his hand to the pit of his stomach. Here's a menu from the gargoyle. Say, hey. you sure do look swell. Some class to me now, hey? Mm -hmm. And watch me pick out a dinner. First, I'll have a cocktail. And then I'll have another cocktail. Let's see. Then I'll have uh, some oysters, green turtle soup, some, some sand dabs, chicken breast. The vain woman re-enters from the changing room. She now has a smooth face and she is looking at herself in a hand glass, smiling and touching her face delightedly. She walks over to the railing and leans over it to the judge. He looks up questioning questioningly. Oh, I am so happy again. Am I not beautiful? You are a vain, foolish woman. And she is deaf. She does not hear his words, but thinks he is complimenting her. Ah, oh, Judgy, you two are susceptible to my charms. <laughs> the judge, in great exasperation, puts away his papers, thrusts the transatlantic folder in his pocket, and slips quietly out. The vain woman saunters past the former poor man, stops near him, posing, and begins to put on her gloves. He looks at her admiringly, then getting to his feet, makes an elaborate but awkward bow. Excuse me, lady, but I've had a big piece of luck today, and I want to celebrate, so I'm having a big dinner. Won't you join me and help me have a good time? Oh, why? What did you say? Um, why, I said I had a big piece of luck today and I'm going to go celebrate. I'm having a fine dinner and I asked if you wouldn't have dinner with me. Really? Do you think so? But then everyone tells me I am. <laughs> what is her trouble? Nut? She is stone deaf. You had better write it. Never. No <laughs> deaf ones for me. 
turns away and consults menu again. Vain woman poses and frequently looks in her hand glass to reassure herself. Former rich citizen re-enters from the changing room. He is dressed in shabby clothes. He has a pipe in his mouth. He walks arrogantly over to the former poor man and addresses him. Give me a light. Hey, who do you think you are? You light out, see? <laughs> well, upon my word, I, I... Stop short in his speech, walks haughtily over to the railing where he stands glowering at the former poor man. The former poor man starts for the street door, but Imp runs after him, waving the bottle of tablets. I'll sell you these for two bits. What is that? Indigestion tablets. Keep them. I don't need them. Vain woman fastens her fur and starts for the street door, giving the former rich citizen a snubbing look as she passes him. Imp stops her and offers the ear trumpet. You might need this. I'll sell it for just a dollar. She does not hear what he says, but she looks her scorn at the ear trumpet and walks proudly out. Boy, what time is it? I have it my watch. Time to milk the cows. The former rich citizen starts angrily toward him and evidently thinking better of it, shrugs his shoulders and stalks majestically to the street door. He pauses with it partly open, turns as if to speak to Imp, drawing himself up haughtily, a ludicrous figure in his shabby outfit. It. Then he goes abruptly out, slamming the door. Scene two. A fortnight has passed. The judge is not about, but we see Imp asleep in a chair. All seems quiet and serene. But suddenly the street door opens noisily and the former poor man bursts into the room. He is haggard and seems in great pain for occasionally he moans. He looks wildly about the room and sees Imp asleep in the chair. He rushes to him. The judge, where is he? I must see him at once. You're too early. He isn't down yet. Don't go to sleep again. I'm nearly crazy. What time does the judge get here? Where does he live? Can't we send for him? Oh, he is liable to come any minute. Uh, and then he may not come for an hour or two. I, I can't stand it much longer. It's driving me crazy. I tell you, I do wish the judge would come. I thought all you wanted to do was eat, drink, and be merry. What's the matter? Eat? Drink it and be merry. Be everything I eat gives me indigestion, and everything I drink, it's something off gives it to me worse. How can I be merry when I'm in this torment all the time? I tell you, the pain is driving me mad. I want to get rid of it. Oh, why doesn't the judge come? What's the judge got to do with it? I am going to beg him to take back this indigestion and give me back my property. It was not so bad. After all, I'm not nearly so bad as this pain in my stomach. The <laughs> door opens slowly and a sorrowful woman enters. The vain woman is weeping softly. Gone is her posing in her proud manner. She walks humbly to the railing and not seeing the judge, she turns to Imp. What's she here for? I must see the judge right away, please. He isn't down yet. You're too... Tell him that it's very important that I am in great distress and that he must see me at once. I said he was not down yet. Seeing that she does not understand, he takes a writing pad from his desk, scribbles a few words, and standing in front of her, holds it up for her to read. Oh, when will he be here? Can't you get him right away? Uh, I'm so unhappy. Walks the floor in agitation. Uh, I cannot hear a word that is said to me. No one seems to want me around, and I'm not invited out anymore. I have the feeling that people are making fun of me. <coughs> <coughs> Instead of praising my beauty. Oh, it is dreadful to be deaf. I want the judge to take away this deafness. 
I would rather have my wrinkles. Oh, too bad, too bad. Has the judge given away my wrinkles? I want them back. I want my very own wrinkles too. Wrinkles are distinguished looking. I don't want to be deaf any longer. <laughs> hey, this lady feels really very bad. Can't you cheer her up a little? Cheer her up, me? What's the joke? The vain woman walks to the curtain door, looks in as if seeking something, then returns to a chair where she sits, weeping softly. <sighs> a peculiar thumping is heard at the street door. The former poor man jumps to his feet in expectancy, uh, hoping it is the judge. Imp also stands waiting. The door opens as though the person that opened it did so with difficulty. The former rich citizen hobbles in. He is ragged and dirty and one foot is bandaged, which causes him to use a crutch. He carries a large milk can. He hobbles painfully to the center of the room. The former rich citizen looks about, then addresses Imp in a rather husky voice. I wish to see the judge at once. It is most urgent. You can't see the judge at once. Why not? I told you it was most urgent. Because he isn't here. He hasn't come in yet. What's your trouble? Trouble? Everything's the trouble. I have been abused, insulted, overworked. Even, even the cows have kicked me. I can't stand it. I won't stand it. I want back my proper place in the world where I can eat and sleep and mingle with my kind. Hobbles to a chair and sits down wearily. What cause have you to squeal so? If you had indigestion like I have all the time, you might be entitled to raise a holler. Why, I can't you eat. You are big, baby. Painful. Pain right here. Howling about your stomach ache. If you had a man-sized problem, there might be some excuse for you. Whereas I, having been used to wealth and respect, have been subjected to the most grueling ordeals. Why, in that dairy, there were a million cows. And they kicked me. They thorned me. They thorned me. <laughs> have either of you gentlemen ever been deaf? It's a terrible thing for a beautiful woman like I am uh, to have such an affliction. Lord, deliver me from this sniffling woman. The former poor man and the former rich citizen start forward eagerly, expecting the judge. Even the vain woman, seeing the others rise, gets to her feet hopefully. Imp hastily slides from his desk, goes to see who knocks. A messenger hands him a letter and silently departs. Letter for me, from the judge. A letter? Why doesn't he come himself? Send for him, boy. Well, well, I wonder what the judge is writing to me for. It's queer he would send me a letter. He looks the letter over carefully, both sides, holds it up to the light, smells it, shakes it, the two men and the woman grow more and more nervous. For goodness sake, open it, read it. Yes, yes, and don't be so long about it. The main woman simply stands pathetically and waits. Imp walks over to his desk, hunts for a knife, finally finds one, looks the letter over again, then slowly slits the envelope and draws out the letter, which he reads silently to himself. They are breathlessly waiting. Imp whistles softly to himself. Well, what do you think of that? What is it? Why don't you tell us? What is it? Come on, don't keep me waiting like this. All right, here it is. My dear imp, I have tried faithfully for years to aid distressed humanity, but they are an ungrateful lot of fools, and I wash my hands of them. When this letter reaches you, I will be on the high seas, and I am never coming back. So write to me in the big old ledger of miseries and shut up shop. 
for the exchange to disclose forever. Yours in disgust, the judge. <laughs> what is it? What has happened? Oh my God, indigestion all the days of my life. Death? Oh, is death? What shall I do? This is an outrage. I am rich and influential. I should take steps to, to. Imp laughs mockingly. The former rich citizen looks down at his milk spattered clothes, his bandaged foot, and letting his crutch fall to the floor, sinks dejectedly into a chair, burying his face in his hands. Imp dangles his keys and opens the street door as an invitation for them to go. The former poor man is the first to start. Imp offers him indigestion tablets. The man grasps them eagerly, tipping Imp, who chuckles as he pockets the money. The former poor man takes a tablet as he exits. The vain woman moves slowly toward the door. Imp chuckles, touches her arm, and offers the ear trumpet. She accepts it with a wild sob, tipping Imp, who again chuckles as he pockets the money. <laughs> the last we see of the vain woman, she is trying to hold the ear trumpet to her ear and exits sobbing. The former rich citizen still sits in his chair, his head in his hands. Imp picks up the milk can and tapping the former rich citizen not too gently on the shoulder, thrusts the milk can at him and makes a significant gesture indicative of this way out. The man rises dejectedly, picks up his crutch, takes the milk can, and hobbles painfully toward the door and exits. <laughs>